Just a reminder that if you're a fan of Padres Hot Tub and you support this show, you can do so at a higher level by going to patreon.com slash Padres Hot Tub, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Padres Hot Tub. Join a group that continues to swell well over 400 now and continuing to grow Rafi uh, that formed the Padres Hot Tub community. And that community had a chance to join us uh, in Lake Elsinore uh, just a week, a couple weeks ago. Uh, as we watched the storm take on the Stockton ports, uh, Chris Reed threw out the first pitch and I uh, attempted to catch it. And uh, it was not only a lot of fun, but it was also the genesis of our uh, potentially returning uh, Splinter Series Storm Chasers, uh, which I'm sure if you are not a patron and you heard that podcast and did not know that we were going to Lake Elsinore, was probably very confusing. Uh, yeah. So if you want to be in the know, with the Padres hot tub and with storm chasers, uh, become a patron. It's just $5 a month. Uh, we'd you, love to have you. You know, Rafi, you weren't there last uh, show, but uh, uh, the official show position is that we were hacked. And yes, right. You know, <laughs> that's some Lake Elsinore deep fake stuff, uh, crept in there when we were supposed to have a Padres swept by the Mets series. Nonetheless, uh, taking big patrons out to the ball game tomorrow. On us, that's a regular feature. Tickets available. Our ticket marketplace helps patrons connect with one another. When you need to go to a game or you need to move tickets from a game, our baseball cards channel continues to have PHT breaks where folks are getting together uh, and, and getting great cards and really enjoying that. There's so much more. So check it out for yourself. Patreon.com slash Padres Hot Tub. Get these shows ad free. Get our bonus shows and more. Patreon.com slash Padres Hot Tub. What's up, everybody? It's Craig Elston. It's Rafi Cantor. There's no Chris Reed. Chris Reed out today. We are in the two out of three PHT era of early summer. <laughs> it was it was me and Chris. Now it's me and Rafi. And guess what? Next week, Rafi, it's going to be you and Chris. It's going to be it's going to be me and Chris. And then the week after that, it might be just you and Chris again. So I mean, it's uh, it's the dog days of summer. The rotation is you know taking some taking some hits here and there we're having to pick up some innings help each other out uh so uh we miss you chris we're looking forward to having you back hopefully later this week we've got a lot to talk about though on today's show because the padres came home and got to winning in fact uh between the last game of the of the road trip that we covered on our previous group therapy uh and the start and now conclusion of the brewer series the team did win four in a row that was interrupted on sunday with a 6-2 loss uh, but still, San Diego takes three out of four against Milwaukee. Uh, San Diego is now eight and three in their last 11 home games. And before we get into each game uh, against the Brewers, Rafi, I mean, two things really stick out. The first is that we've had the classical statistical regression to the mean, both positive and, and negative. The team was 19 and 10 on the road. Now they're 20 and 19. The team was way under 500. Uh, at home. Now, I think they're back to 500 or really close to it. I'll look that up. Um, but like I said, eight and three in their last 11. So cool, normal, I guess, uh, expected. And the other thing is that Coors Field South continues to be Coors <laughs> Field South. The Padres get home and just pummel home runs like they're a mile high. Yeah, we keep waiting for uh, the the mighty hand of regression that uh, you were just referring to. I think uh, going into today, the Padres uh, at Petco Park, not the Padres, Petco Park, the stadium, had a home run park factor of 140, which is just absurdly, you know, again, 100 is league average. So 40% more home runs happening at Petco Park than you would expect in a neutral ballpark this year. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, it, you can attribute that uh, to the fact that, you know, they've continued to move the fences in. And as you cut down on the square footage of the outfield you're gonna not only give up more home runs but you're also going to give up fewer hits of other types um you know that's one of the things of 
why Coors is such an in, you know such a beast and such an offensive driver. It's not necessarily that they're giving up the most home runs. It's that it has the largest square footage of like basically any outfield in baseball. So stuff is just dropping. Um, but it's certainly uncharacteristic. Just like this, like weirdly humid heat. Uh, I'm I'm back in the six one nine as we record this right now, uh, and it is uh, kind of uh, sweltering in a way that I would I don't normally associate with June and like kind of a. Uh, the heaviness of the air, it feels a little East Coasty right now. Um, so weirdness abound happening right now. But uh, you had texted me and Chris, uh, you know, a little bit ago, just talking about the things that were unsustainable about the Padre season so far. You know, their their uh, record against lefties, their away record, and there was a third thing. I don't know if you recall what it was. Robert Suarez being perfect. Oh, and there you go. And there you go. And all of those things came to a head against the Phillies, which you guys discussed. Um, and now, you know, we we're seeing even more of that, uh, at home as, uh, the Padres with a good series against a very good Brewers team. Yeah. Uh, we'll go game by game here. Uh, the top storyline, if you're really paying close attention is that the Padres won on a major night, a cease night and a Vasquez night (laughs) back to back, because previously, if you had combined all of Vasquez's starts, all of major starts in the last seven of ceases starts. The Padres were five and fourteen in those starts, so and upgrade that to seven and uh, eight and fourteen, which is still not great. But uh, nonetheless, getting those wins on nights when you have starters out there that you really can't count on, and Cease, I hope you will be able to count on at some point very soon uh, in the future, but right now he's giving up a lot of runs and he's not getting deep into ball games. He's just striking out guys. Uh, everything else is, is not going great. So those things winning on those nights. And then I would also add winning with Profar banged up and playing to now. So banged up, he's not playing Arise banged up and playing Manny on the mend, you know, Camposano goes out. So we're really seeing the bottom of the roster for the Padres and it's put some dubs and maybe some much needed dubs up on the board. Adam Major, before he was called up from the minor leagues, had something like a 50 strike to nine walk ratio, 50 strikeout to nine walk ratio. This is not a kid who was having command issues uh, down in the minor leagues. He comes up here and all of a sudden you can't throw strikes. Um, I don't see that as a long term issue. I see that as a kid who was called up probably sooner than he imagined. The nerves are clearly still there. He's working through some stuff. Um, you know, the the fastball is, you know, cooking at like 95, 96 miles an hour consistently. Uh, I'm sure as he works with Ruben Niebla, um, things will only continue to improve. And I'm sure that Adam Azure also will have some more time to cook down in the minor leagues once the Padres rotation gets a little bit more right. Um, but uh, yeah, he got bailed out by a, a, a fantastic double play initiated by Manny Machado in which, you know, he was moving away, you know, towards the third base foul line, turned completely through across his body to Jake Cronenworth at second, who had an awesome first baseman like pick there, quickly turned and threw it to Luis Arise, who had another awesome first baseman pick on the other side. Um, And that probably saved, I mean, not not probably, it did save the game for them because that the game took uh, until the bottom of the ninth inning to clear out. Um, But uh, yeah, I mean, the Padres won a few games this weekend kind of by the skin of their teeth. and. you know, well, just before I pass it back to you, the only other thing is John and I on Pods Above Replacement did a whole episode about Dylan Cease when he got traded here. And the uh, theme of the episode was, man, this guy is exactly like right-handed Blake Snell. And what do you know? Sometimes watching Dylan Cease pitch is a little frustrating. And that's what we were experiencing with Blake Snell. Uh, the difference is that... Uh, you know, Blake Snell, whereas Dylan Cease has not been walking as many guys as Blake Snell uh, has, uh, he's been getting bit by the home run ball in a way that we didn't see Blake Snell last year. Um, so a lot to chew on with this rotation, um, but we got some unexpected wins and unexpected places, and boy, did we need it, Craig. Yeah, uh, just going back to that Thursday game, I mean, we did a whole segment on Friday's Andy and Elston about that double play and, and the first inning of that game in particular, because it's the nature of doing it every day, but I've heard so much Manny almost trash talk going on. Mm-hmm. Like 
people insinuating that he's overweight or out of playing shape uh, and with no basis of that is the guy wears baggy uniforms like you have no idea what you're talking about unless you've seen him with his shirt off. Um, and I'm not saying that I've seen him with his shirt off. I'm saying that I you don't know. Say, go on, please. Yeah, no, I'm saying <laughs> that I don't know either. Um, but, you know, I, I also, you know, it's kind of a straw man to knock down. But, you know, people saying you sh- he's selfish for playing, bench his ass, put him on the injured list. He's not going to contribute. Well, Manny's been hitting. Like, quietly, he's been starting to find his groove. He's not hitting for power. He explained during the East Coast road trip in extreme detail why he's not able to get to that power spot, get to the slot with his elbow to allow to be able to drive the ball. And through it, he's posting up and he's making big plays. And on Thursday, that double play at least saved two runs. Because it was gonna two runs would have scored if it got by him, at least. And then there's still one out, and Major's on the mound melting down. So God only knows how many runs come in. Then he hits a three run homer, the very bottom of the inning, which by the way was uh aided by the fact that Bryce Terang bobbled a routine double play instead of an incredibly hard double play. So just right there, Manny added five runs to the plus minus on a game that the Padres wound up winning by one. <laughs> and I know it all happened in the first inning, and Cronenworth is the hero because he got his homer in the ninth inning. But I, I really felt that Manny showed you there, and I think showed you all weekend, you know, followed that up with a four-hit game on Friday, had, had a couple more hits today. Like, it, it shows you why the Padres don't listen to every talk radio caller or Twitter poster or YouTube chatter who says Manny Machado should be on the injured list. Uh, Yeah. Uh, Also, you might not know this as a sleeper agent, but you might be talking with one of those aforementioned uh, talk radio hosts, Twitter posters, YouTubers, uh, who frankly has been, uh, you know, like heartened by Manny's performance in the Milwaukee series. Uh, But I, uh, you know, I wasn't on the show with you guys uh, on Wednesday or Thursday, whenever group therapy was. Uh, but I, th- that quote that Manny gave about like, oh, my 60 to 70 percent is better than, you know, people's 100 percent. I found to be uh, a little tone deaf um, and because it it very much reeked of 2023 where he said, you know, oh, you know, in, in April. We're not hitting now, but I'll be hitting when it's time. Like, you know, don't jump on the bandwagon. And then they missed the playoffs uh, with them, one of the most stacked teams ever. And, and something that you pointed out, too, of like Machado's been on the team since 2019. And the team's almost exactly 500 in that five year span. And um, what I keep hoping for is the turn from Manny as he enters into his 30s and into this, this you know, long to where he's going to start to have a different sort of tone, frankly, which I think uh, is a tone that we've heard Xander Bogart give. Uh, it's a turn that it's a tone that once uh, Fernando Tatis Jr. experienced his massive humbling on a na- nationwide scale, global scale, that he has now had, uh, and it's a tone, frankly, that in the two and a half months he's been in the major leagues, Jackson Merrill has had basically every time he's given an interview, which is like, I'm just here to play ball. I'm just here to do whatever. And uh, I still think we're just getting these like weird quotes from Manny that are like, ah, yeah, you know, like I'm, I'm banged up, but I'm still good when like, he's clearly not. And so I, I, I that's just my issue. Like it, it has Manny been better of late. Yes, absolutely. Uh, does this team need him to be better? Yes, absolutely. I mean, this is something that uh, has been talked about. I know John Percota has been talking about it with me and on the Discord and stuff. But, you know, this team at 500 as we speak, as we live and breathe right now, 82 games into the season, there's exactly 500. It has gotten 1.5 F4 total from Manny Machado, Xander Bogarts, Yu Darvish, and Joe Musgrove. The right. guys who they're paying... Uh, all the money, uh, you know, except for Tatis, who has who has had a fantastic season so far, two and a half wins, you know, going to be an all star as he should. Um, 
this team is uh we have to be happy that this team is 500 like we we really have to be happy this team is 500 because they've gotten performances in unexpected places and uh so you know i i hope i'm not coming off as like some bitter like talk show host like whatever but I, i'm just like at, this team clearly has another gear that is not being unlocked because basically they're getting everything that they can out of the five through nine spots in their order and in the other parts of their rotation. And so, yeah, I, I guess I'm just looking for a little perspective for Manny, but maybe I'm never going to get that. And that's, that's foolish of me to think that. Manny Machado views a, a huge part of his leadership as being there in adverse circumstance. That's, that's definitely how he's wired. He he cannot imagine putting himself on the shelf for 10 or 15 days, having the team struggle and not being there. To He'd rather the team struggle with him in than for the team to struggle with him out, knowing that he gets, you know, 31 million this year and a 35 million average, you know, over the course of a 10-year uh, contract coming up here. So. I have come to kind of understand it. I do agree that the, and, and Chris said something similar on Thursday too, like, or Wednesday, pardon me, that, you know, hopefully there's a maturity to Manny at some point to, to recognize when is too much. You know, in particular, the quote, the Mark Feinstein quote about my 60 to 70 is more than someone's 100. That's just Manny's arrogance. Like, he'll never not be arrogant. But the, the one he said to, to Ace about, Oh, I'll blow up my elbow if that's what it takes. We're going to get this right. It's like, no, dude, that's not what we need. Yeah. We don't need you to blow out your elbow. We need you if you need if you think you're going to blow out your elbow, take a month off. Uh we'll we'll try and survive. We're 500 in a muddled west uh, and, and in a muddled national league. But uh I I think that was hyperbolic as well. I think he's getting better. I think he's feeling better. He's playing the field that's critical to the San Diego Padres. His defense at third base is so important. And he's sixth on the team in homers, which is wild. <laughs> he was passed by like everyone, even while he hit a home run uh, this weekend. As as Merrill's up to ten, and Kim's up to ten, and Profar's up to ten, and Cronenworth is up to twelve. So, uh, you know, if that power surge is coming from Manny, it'll be very beneficial to this team. Uh, you know, come the second half. Now, the other thing about Thursday is that they won a game where they didn't have Robert Suarez available and they really shouldn't have had Jeremiah Estrada available. He was pitching for the fourth time in five days, was completely out of it, uh, gave up two runs to blow the save, but did strike out three in his inning. And then Cronenworth gets the exciting walk off. But the Padres bullpen, I mean, here's the funny thing. I mean, you, you talked about that stat. That's a stat that that John brought up, and 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 you've brought up, and I, you know, brought it up on the radio too. Um, I look at three rotation spots that all three are actively in flames right now. Darvish is hopefully going to put a big blanket over one of those fires on the major start day. You know, Vasquez shucked and jived his way through five. I mean, he, that was not a, a quality performance but randy vasquez is giving up a 500 on base percentage to left-handed batters so you know like getting getting five shutout from him is incredible uh and cease again cease is giving up a ton of runs so you've got that you've got the team playing its third 13 game set with one day off uh consecutive and you've got a bullpen as a result that's mostly on fumes and you've got over half the lineup either hurt or playing hurt. And the team's still 500. Like, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's which way do you want to cut this? Do you want to go, these four guys have such poor performance, this team's 500. Or all of this shit is happening and this team's 500. Like, depending on how you want to look at this team, you can look at it any way you want. Yeah, and just to go back to that last point, we, we touched on this like a week or two ago. I don't understand MLB schedules and how the Padres have played 82 games, whereas the Bra I know this is because, uh, you know, the Braves built their home stadium in the wettest part of the Atlanta metro area. So they're constantly getting rained out. I don't know how that happened. Google it. It's insane. Um, but the Braves have only played 75 games and the Padres have played 82 games. 
the Nationals coming into town have played 77 games. The Padres have played 82 games. Like, uh, you know, the, the, the same thing with the Cardinals have played 76 games. We've played four or five. The Dimebacks played 78, and they're in our division, and they've got a roof on the, the, their stadium, and they play in the desert. Like, I don't understand how we've ended up playing four more games than anyone else at this point. And so while, yes, we are currently in the final wild card spot uh, and, uh, you know, that's obviously very tenuous because we still have a massive pack of NL teams that are all within, you know, there's like seven teams that are all within like a game and a half of each other uh, right now. But we have some wins in hand. We have some losses in hand, but we have some wins in hand that some of these other teams don't have. Uh, and so for instance, we you know we're only a game ahead of the diamondbacks in the schedule, uh, or in the standings, excuse me, but we have three more wins than them. So, and, and one more loss. So, you know, I, I, I think it's kind of a false, uh, I'm not going to get cocky at any point, uh, over the course of this, because we're only 500, but I, I do think that, um, we have a bit of a stronger record than some of these other teams might indicate. Um, but, uh. Yeah, I mean, look, Jeremiah Estrada is a case of he got that amazing 13 consecutive strikeout records. That's like a Padres ass record, by the way. Like, that's a thing right. that, like, they're going to do a giveaway for next year. Like, I guarantee you they'll have some sort of bobblehead. And when, you know, <laughs> whatever happens with this year, uh, you know, uh, ho hoping for the best, but, but they'll be able to be like, oh, remember, remember Jeremiah Strata, 13 strikeouts and Groupner remember will be out there. Remember walk off talking, homers back in June? Of, you like remember a that? Jeremiah Strata rosin bag or some shit. I don't know what they're going to give away. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, now he's been in the league. For a little bit of time, I know he was in the league in Chicago, but teams are getting tape on him. And one of the things that you saw, you saw a very talented Yankees team consistently swinging under his bat. And what were the Brewers doing this weekend? They had that time to make the adjustment and say, okay, when Estrada comes in, swing a couple inches higher than you think you need to swing. And you saw Reese Hoskins almost put one of the seats. Thankfully didn't because it saved the game. And, uh, you know, baseball is a game of adjustments. And we're seeing that constantly. And this is a prime example of that. And so I'm glad that Jeremiah Estrada got a little bit more time off um, because, you know, we're playing uh, a series against the team that is literally next to us in the standings, which I don't know how that happened in the Nationals upcoming. And we're going to need our victory formation. And so while this loss is obviously not something that we want today, uh, it'll be good to have Suarez and Estrada fresh for the coming series. I very much agree about that. And when you really look at the first half of the Padres bullpen performance, their best performer has been obviously Suarez, but then it's Morahone. Morahone yeah. has had the second best performance out of the bullpen in the first half. Estrada's actually third uh, on that list because of the nature of the way he's given ground over the course of the last month or so, where he's pitched to an ERA of around six uh, for the last month. Now, He's still punching out 43% of his hitters. You know, he's had a lot of outings where he's given up a run, but still struck out two or three uh, in the innings. So the swing and miss is there. But um, what I think about Estrada is that he is in the process of developing potentially into an elite back end arm, but that process is not instant. It's not as easy as turning him up to 99 like they did on MLB The Show for a couple weeks. You know, like you can be that for a minute, but to have the consistency, to have the endurance, to have the focus, to post up, to get past people's adjustments. Estrada's learning all of that. His stuff is incredible. He's not utterly reliable at this time. Of course, most of the bullpen, you can say that. You can literally look at every guy in the bullpen and tell, talk about times that they've done really well. And other times that they've done really badly. I mean, but that's that's just a bullpen. You know what I mean? Like, I think people are always sort of like, uh, I don't know, uh, naive, Pollyannish, whatever you want to say when it comes to like, uh, we'd like to look back and remember that like, oh, these are storied Padres bullpens. We had Darren Balsley and then we have now we have Ruben Niebla and we just were always able to crank out relievers like that, you know, like we didn't used to blow games ever. Like the, the fact that Robert Suarez made it almost halfway through the season without giving up a blown save and a loss. Unbelievable. Truly, truly unbelievable. Um, and 
I mean, that's just the nature of bullpen arms. There's a reason that they're in the bullpen. They're not good enough to be starters. So you're just going to have flare up games like this. Um, so I don't know. I feel like mostly like really good about our bullpen. Um, and I, I last time I checked, I'm going to double check right now. Um, the Padres were uh, like in the top 10 in bullpen ERA. I think we've probably sunk down a little bit as of late. Uh, but yeah, we've sunk down a lot. Uh, actually now I'm looking at it we're now ranked 18th uh with a 399 ERA uh as of late uh but a 381 FIP you know we've been that's that's 11th in the league so we haven't been getting the results that you would have expected by now but I, I I think it's like really really hard to complain about the bullpen or bullpen management in a way that maybe we had a little bit more fodder when Sleepy Bob was here well, if if the two lefties that the Padres put a lot of money into could get out a left-handed batter in Yuki yeah. Matsui and Wandy Peralta, then this team would be completely fine in the bullpen. But those two guys have been so unreliable, both against left-handed batters uh, and also just overall, Yuki with his walk rate, Wandy with his two-out blow-ups and the homers he allows and so many balls in play, uh, that I think there's a lot of guys who have been really difficult to manage for Mike Schilt. I think he's actually done a much better job with this group than maybe could be seen from the outside because he's got so many guys that both tantalize and disappoint. De Los Santos. I talked about this Friday on the show, Rafi. De Los Santos has given up an on-base percentage to righties of about 270. That's wow. it's delightful. Obviously, you want to bring him in with righties on base. Also, he's given up nine home runs in 31 innings. So. Obviously, you don't want to bring him on with anyone on base. So, like, but what are you supposed to do with that when it's live fire and there's a right-handed batter coming up and there's a couple runners on and you really need an out? You know, it, you go to the guy who might get you an out, and if he blows up, he blows up in your face. So it, it's a difficult bullpen to manage. I think he's done a good job, and obviously it's predicated on Robert Suarez being an everyman doing everything, pitching a five-out save, pitching the eighth inning, pitching the ninth inning with a four-run lead, uh, and all the other things. The Suarez house rules are anything goes. It's, it's, it's cute. They just like slapped it on top of the door. Anything goes, and that's the Suarez house rule. Yeah, and I mean, speaking of using the bullpen in different ways, I mean, uh, we've seen a lot less of Stephen Kolick uh, as of late. And I think that that's a learning experience, but also to give a credit to Stephen Kolick, he had to go out there on Friday and throw 40 pitches. And basically, you know, Mike Schultz said, this is your game. Uh, you know, the Padres had a good lead at that point. Um, but, uh, you know, the bullpen was taxed. And uh, so they're deploying Kolick, I think, in the appropriate locations now, uh, which is that. He's the last guy up, and when you really need him, you need him. But he's doing even Stephen Kolick has a role for now on this team, which is that he's there to be a sponge to soak up innings. Uh, you know, we saw the return of Tom Cosgrove, uh, who has been doing really well in El Paso as of late, which is like I always like love, love, love. You know, it's it's horrible to see these relievers get shelled and sent back down to the minors, and you're just like you you never know if you're going to see them again. Like they might just have never figured it out. And so it's so great to see Tom Cosgrove back on the team, uh, did well. And uh, just to, to, cause you brought up Wandy Peralta. Um, I have uh, threatened to become an AJ Preller apologist on the discord uh, because I think we've seen AJ grow a little bit, um, you know, which you would hope for someone who's been in the job for a decade. Um, but then, Little stuff reminds me that, oh, actually, like stuff like sign the Wandy Peralta signing is just a reminder of, ah, eh, maybe he hasn't grown all that much because all of the warning signs were there for Wandy Peralta. He had really high FIPS in New York, like you know, really high expected statistics, had some good outcomes, had a you know sub three ERA, and he signed him to a four year, sixteen million dollar deal, and uh. So it's hard for me to, to, this is Wandy Peralta. You know what I mean? The issue is, is that he's what we've got in these situations. It's not that, oh, Wandy Peralta should be better. Wandy Peralta's being himself. It's just that this is what we got. 
So I, I'm with you. I'm I'm at generally pretty happy about the way that Mike Schilt has handled the bullpen. Yeah, name a more iconic duo than AJ Preller and mediocre lefties that he falls in love with and gives four year <laughs> contracts to. You know, Mr. Pomerantz is waving hello after being waved by three different teams this year. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, Jay Cronenworth, what an incredible weekend! Uh, you know, bombing home runs, five hit game. He's made this transition to second base. Now he's making some really, really cool plays on the pivot uh, at second base. I've, I've seen him at least twice make great plays around the bag at second where his first base instincts uh, have, have shown. Uh, but he's still got the range. A rise is hideable at first. He's been fine, you know, at first. So, so this works. But... One of the big stories, I think, of this year is Cronenworth back to 2021 form. You know, last year, that contract looked absolutely horrible. And the way he's playing right now, he's playing for two years worth of value this year. Yeah, I mean, I remember uh, going back to the offseason, there was an inordinate amount of discussion about Jake Cronenworth's contract being the millstone around the neck of this franchise, that if we could just trade Jake Cronenworth, then we would have more flexibility to do all this stuff. And I think it's a reminder of a couple of things. One, I disagreed with that during the offseason, and I still disagree with it now. Obviously, it's a little easier to disagree, which is that paying Jake Cronenworth, you know, somewhere between 10 and $12 million a year is not the issue with the Padres' finances. It's not. It wasn't if six months ago, and it's not now. Um, and it's also the second point I wanted to make is that, oh, yeah, Jake Cronenworth is a good baseball player. <laughs> <laughs> like it's like he had an off year and they moved him to first base which d decimated his value and uh you know and we were like wow this broken toy that we had just signed what the hell and it's just a reminder that you know he's i think 29 or 30 at this point he's definitely got a few more peak years left in him um he's uh i think he's close to a two win season at this point and just a reminder like Eight, nine million dollars is basically what a win equates to. So Jake Cronenworth has already paid for himself this year, and it's June 23rd. Um, and I suspect that Jake Cronenworth will not have an issue continuing to pay for himself as the year goes on uh, and as his career goes on. But uh, man, having that, that bat at second base is, feels so much different than having it at first base, doesn't it? Uh, it does. I mean, you know, then you got to say, well, we've got a ping hitter at first base, but it's Luis Arise, who's kind of the ultimate ping hitter. So, yeah, it, it winds up being OK. Um, you know, this lineup is an interesting, funny bag. And obviously, it's supposed to be propped up by Manny Machado, Fernando Tatis Jr. and Xander Bogarts. And so far, one of those three has regularly contributed to this team. Manny's going to be there. I, I really do think he's got a good summer ahead of him. I think he's got a comeback summer ahead of him. We'll see what happens with Xander Bogarts. I really do think the team's missed him uh, over the last two, three weeks, even though his performance in April was one that no one would miss. And there's there's no question about that. But uh, the team has found offense in other places. I mentioned earlier, Kim is up to 10 homers now. You know, for a guy batting at the bottom of your lineup, a shortstop that's, that maybe hits 20 home runs this year, Every team would take that, and some other team will take that next year when they sign him uh, to a giant free agent contract. Um, a little bit, a little bit of a better performance from the rotation. Honestly, not really. Honestly, not really. The rotation was pretty bad this weekend. I mean, who was the best? Major didn't make it through five. We didn't Cease get any didn't make it. Th that yeah, was Cease the issue. didn't make it through five. Vasquez yeah. made it through five. I guess he was the winner, five shutout innings, but he gave up like nine base runners in five innings. And then today, you know, Michael King had another one of those days. Michael King is a very interesting pitcher. I'm glad he's on the team. You know, he's, he's, he's got value. He's a veteran that on certain days is electric. Uh, he has not be, been the home run Pez dispenser uh, that he had been in the first month or the first few starts of the season uh he's really calmed down on that i think it's three homers in his last 10 starts so that's good but today 
you know, today he got just singled to death, uh, two outs singled to death in the second inning. He gave up that five spot. And then honestly, at that point, down 5-1, the Padres, uh, with all the bullpen issues they've had, like, I, they they tried. They, they tried to come back two or three times, but this this almost was a decent day for a reset. Yeah, I mean, it just felt like the gravity of 500 was too strong to escape exactly. for this team. Like it just like it felt you like you almost knew coming into today. And I mean, we haven't even touched on Friday night. You know, Tatis got hit in the elbow, and it also seemed like he maybe came up a little limp chasing down a fly ball. So there's a number of uh, reasons, which of course we're not privy to because we're in the Padres injury black hole. Uh, that uh, you know, Tatis did not appear Saturday, and he did not appear today. Um, and uh, questions remain about what's going on. But not only do we not have his fantastic spark plug, which has obviously been on fire as of late of a bat, um, but we also had David Peralta in right field, and there was an instance today where you know uh, I, I can't remember who it was, uh, Bryce Terang hit a triple yeah. that. Probably should have been a single, like just yeah. the way that it was hit, uh, because it was, uh, you know, it hit to the just the right part. Plus, Peralta was slow. Plus, he didn't know how to play the carom off the Petco porch. And it just was this add up and that allowed the bases to get cleared and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, I, you know, watching Michael King, you know, today, it, it was really hard for me to fault him. That first hit in the inning, the Willie Adamas bloop single, had an expected batting average of .080. Uh, it just found the exact right spot, and that's the thing that started the entire inning. If that, you know, if that uh, play goes into a glove, I mean, they score maybe one run that inning. And right. so, um, I'm I'm not going to take a lot away from that Michael King game today. Uh, but yeah, to me, it felt like divine intervention in some way that this team is just destined to be a 500 and that's where we're going to be, uh, until the forces at bay decide to change things. <laughs> yeah, no, probably at the end of the year, we will, we'll, we'll be there, but it, it's funny, man. I think I wrote this in the discord earlier. Like if the, if, if baseball God came down to us on March 19th before the Korea series began and said, listen, you're going to have three straight walk-off homers at home. You're going to have more one run wins than you had all last year in the first half. You're going to have more comeback wins than you had last year in the first half. You're going to have incredible dynamic performances from unexpected areas and you're going to be 500 at the break 92.4 percent of padres fans and of padres hot tub listeners would have signed up to that deal as they should have yeah, yeah. they had been like cool so we're going to have fun and it's going to be 500 which is better than what they were at this point last year i believe the padres were seven games under 500 that last year sucked <laughs> Last year sucked. Yeah. It truly did. This year's team has been far better to follow. If there's one reason why this team has been far better to follow, it's because a grumpy, insular, strikeout prone, mm -hmm. taking strike three, mm -hmm. sure he can run down a ball, maybe he'll hit a homer. But goddamn, he sucks to watch. Center fielder. Say it, Craig. Frank Grisham. Got replaced <laughs> by Jackson fucking Merrill. Who might be a superstar in this league for the next decade. Who plays with heart. Who plays with an attitude. Who is very personable. Very relatable to an average baseball fan. Doesn't hurt that he's hit seven homers in 11 games. Almost hit another one today to make it eight in 11 games. Went seven for 16 in the Brewers series. Finally moved up to fifth in the batting order. Jackson Merrill, 
10 of 10 no notes. Jackson Merrill has had the perfect start to his career. Um, you know, I always think about that scene in Moneyball where there's all the old scouts that are in there and they're using all these, you know, terminologies of like, oh, you see the way he fills out a pair of jeans. You see what this guy's girlfriend looks like. Like, you know, he's got hips like a ball player, like whatever. And that was the way that town evaluation used to happen. And then obviously Billy Bean changes that. Uh, and you also have the newfangled nerds like me and Prakota who like looking at the expected statistics, the, the raw data. Um, and when you can please both of those crowds, you have a superstar on your hand, truly. And that's, and that's what it is with Jackson Merrill. Um, every time he gives an interview, I, I can't not listen because he's magnetic. He's personable. He says like, kind of like the pat, like the thing you would hope he would say, but he says it well. And in a way where you can tell he really means it, um, which is rare. Um, and I mean, <laughs> he's just good. Like he's just, he's got like one of the prettiest swings in baseball already. As a 21, just turned 21 year old, um, his, uh, you know, kind of, you, you can look at the line chart of the rolling expected statistics. Uh, and he's at basically the high point of his young career so far. His, in his last 100 plate appearances, he has an expected WOBA of 379, which just to, to put that in perspective, um, players that have, have a 379 WOBA so far this year JD Martinez, Jordan Alvarez, Better than Rafa Devers, Tyler O'Neill, better than Trey Turner, better than Kyle Schwarber. Like he's been playing, you know, expected to be playing better than all those guys in the last 100 plate appearances. So we're seeing a young superstar catch fire. And oh, by the way, he plays really good defense and like 87th percentile good defense. And that was the one thing we were worried about. Okay, we're going to put Merrill in there. He's going to hit for contact. Maybe won't hit for power. He does. Uh, maybe won't be able to play defense. He absolutely can. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm hoping that this kid not only is a rookie of the year candidate, which he absolutely is. He's second in F4 for NL rookies, only to Joey Ortiz on the Brewers. I'm hoping he's an all star. And I think there's still time to make it happen. I don't want him to be an all star. Mm. Um, that's going to be my last time that I put a restrictor plate on Jackson Merrill. I want him to be an all-star next year. Mm. Uh, I just, I'm on this tip and I'm not getting off it. I used to compare him to Yelich, but the Will Clark comparison is just, it just fits. It just fits so well. And I know that Will Clark was a first baseman, but it's the combination of the talent and the attitude. It's the combination of the talent with the swagger that's not quite cocky, but it kind of is cocky, but it's mostly just confident, but it's still within a team dynamic. You know, every time he was talked about like, well, what about rookie of the year? And he goes, I don't care about any of that. I don't care about rookie of the year. I don't care about all stars. I care about this team in here and I care about winning. Like, yes. Amazing. Give this man an eight year deal. It's the smartest thing the franchise could do. The value is there. AJ, give him credit. He knew. Not a lot of people did. Not a lot of people did. No one projected this. No one. No one projected this. Everyone projected a, a, a smaller version of this. Not this. And, and obviously, there's plenty of season to come. But you look at the kid, you look at the character of the player, like you're betting on that. You're betting on that long term. Th this is such an exciting development because it goes beyond the Preller promise of a restocking of a farm system to the actual delivery of a true, true ball player. So my exit question to you out of this portion of the discussion is the last couple of days out of necessity with Profar and Tatis out and Camposano out. Jackson Merrill moved up to five in the lineup. On Saturday, he delivered a three-run homer, batting fifth in the lineup to put the team up 3 nothing. Where's the idealized spot for Jackson Merrill to bat in the second half of the season? 
if this team had some guts, they'd bat Jackson Merrill third. And I think that the uh, I'll give the credit to John Pakoda for saying that first, and I absolutely love the idea. And here's why: you'd have Arias batting leadoff. You'd have Tatis in the two spot. You would have uh, Merrill third. Again, he's got pop, but he's also has average, which I think is important for someone in the three spot. And then cleanup, you would put Jerks in Profar. Then you'd put Machado five and you'd put Cronenworth six. That's a long, that's a long lineup. And uh, so that, and then you still have Kim, who's no joke. You'll have Higashioka, who as of late has been fantastic. I mean, I don't want to say fantastic, but he's been really good. He's been really good. He's, he's has some pops. Uh, he, uh, he's hit 10 home runs exactly each of the last three seasons. And it looked like he was going to fall short of that. And now looks like he's right on schedule for that. Maybe more, but who knows? Um, and then you've got, you know, whoever you want to fill in in that eight spot, depending on who's healthy or not. Um, I think that's a really good lineup. And uh, I, I don't know. Where would you bat him? Yeah, I think that's probably right. I, I I think realistically they won't do that. No. Be, because Mike Schilt plays office politics and does it very well. So he'll continue with either Cronenworth or Profar uh, in the three spot. Probably Profar. Because he's shown the willingness to back Cronenworth a little bit lower in the lineup. Jake's been great, but I I don't disagree. I think idealized maybe, maybe at the end of the year. But like the closer you get Merrill to the other key players in the team, the more his good bat has a chance to interact with those players within the lineup. So I could see them. Let me see a way that they could keep him five. So a rise to Tease, Profar. Machado, Merrill, Cronenworth, like, uh, they'd probably move him to six and that's the highest they'd go, uh, from, a, from a politics standpoint, from a, from a performance standpoint, if he keeps on anything like this, I agree with you and John, I think three, they're going to, for, they're going to force his hand. They're not going to put Merrill and Cronenworth next to each other. Cause they don't have enough lefties. They have to spread them out. Um, but also it's worth noting uh, in, I don't know, a month if we're lucky, maybe more, Bogarts is going to be back in this lineup too. Right. And so then now you're looking at, if we're getting anywhere to what we are, we would hope and expect out of Xander Bogarts, you're getting a really, really, really deep lineup as this team goes into the home stretch of the year. Um, so, uh, you know, there's obviously still question marks. We saw that when we had Profar and Tatis out in the same game and we had an outfield of left field Tyler Wade, center field Merrill, and right field David Peralta with uh, Jose Azokar to the rescue if they one of them went down. Uh, so, you know, health is still very, very, very important to this team. But it's a lineup. It's going to make a run. It's going to make a run in, if everyone's healthy. Single easiest thing the Padres can do to improve their team is to replace Jose Azokar with a competent right-handed batting outfielder that can do more than just pinch run and pinch field. But that's a story for another show. Um, we're about to get to a fun trivia question that you haven't given me the answer to. Uh, we'll do this briefly. Chris wanted to push it to the main show. Then, unfortunately, he couldn't make it. Uh, earlier in this past week, John Boy uh, put up one of his breakdowns of what happened last Sunday at Shea Stadium when Manny got thrown out on a bullshit pitch. Uh, and then Mike Schilt got thrown out and John Boy did one of his classic lip reading videos, uh, which revealed that Mike, you know, engaged in theater uh, on the field and pretty much praised the ump. It's like, hey, you're doing a good job. Now you fucking <laughs> missed that fucking pitch, but you're doing a good job out here. But, you know, I got to go. So why don't you run me? Um, and the guy's like, OK, we'll do what you have to do. And Mike's like. I'm really not into yelling and screaming right now. I think you're a swell fella. Why don't you throw me out anyway? And, and then he finally did. And then Schultz's like, whoa, what are you doing? Um, you know, I, I got to tell you, Rafe, the first time I saw this video, I was like, what the fuck? 
Like, what? Mike, I know you used to shine umpires' shoes, but you don't have to do it anymore. You're the manager of the San Diego Padres now. You literally don't have to go shine their shoes. So don't don't feel like you have to. Then I thought about it a little more. And like, how many times has this happened in big league history? Probably 213 times it's happened in big league history where the manager didn't really want to get run, but he had to get run. So he went out there and he said, listen, you're going to have to run me. You know, I, I, I mentioned on the radio, there was, I forget when it was when I was growing up or as an adult, but there was a, I think it was a credit card commercial that ran for a very long time of the manager and the umpire turning their caps around and getting in each other's face and going like, you're doing a hell of a job. I agree. Where are you going to dinner? Let's go get a steak. All right. That's great. You're out of here. You know, like, so, I mean, I think this is honestly, Rafe, been part of baseball for a very, very long time. And I think Mike Schilt, unfortunately, found himself in the barrel this week. Thanks to John Boy. As long as Manny Machado's not mad at him, there's nothing to be said about this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'm with you 100%. I think the contrast uh is a couple things one so we live in the john boy era so that's number one like we you know mike schilt for most of his career did not live in the john boy era and now we do the second is john boy is a new york yankees fan and the yankees have aaron boone as their manager who is on a bobby cox like sort of streak of getting thrown out of games had an incredibly artful one i recommend people go watch the clip uh the other night where marcus stroman started mouthing off to the umpire on a borderline call and was on like 82 pitches in the seventh inning. So easily had another, you know, inning in him at least. And Boone knew that and was trying to save his bullpen. So he just starts throwing shit and like oh, crazy. And it's like the most tactical temper tantrum I've ever seen. It's amazing. Uh, and so the contrasting of that with Shill, I had a similar reaction the first time I saw it and I read the comments and it kind of felt like uh, when Scotty Scheffler had the whole kerfuffle at the PGA championship and he, you know, got so wrongfully arrested and then was out doing a presser six hours later. And he's like, you know, I respect the cops. I respect what they do. And it's like, no, Scotty, you have the chance to <laughs> do the cool thing. And uh, of course he wasn't going to do that. Uh, but it kind of reminded me a little of that or he's Schultz just like, man, you got a hard job. I respect what you do. And I'm like, ah, it's just kind of lame. It just, it's just lame. Oh, but- it was lame. There's yeah. no question it was lame. And he already has like a, in, in a way that I think is good for a, a, a steady Eddie manager, a, a baseball lifer. He has kind of a lame vibe to him, you know? He um, really does, but honestly. Th- but that's okay. Like, that's okay. We don't need our managers. To, like, this team would be a disaster if you had someone like Ozzy Guillen managing it. Like, it would just be, and like, I think people want, they think they want that because it'll be exciting. But that's not what you want from the manager. We have enough of that as, from AJ Preller. Like we have enough craziness organizationally from AJ Preller. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't have much to say. This will be a non-story. I I said to you before. I was like I you know Chris wanted to wait until I was on to start. So I feel bad talking about it now. But also this is going to be a non-story in three days. So yeah. we kind of need to talk about it now. But you know. John Boy's really good at what he does, and you kind of that that's a tip your cap. That's totally a tip your cap. It really is. Mike, you got got, man. You got yeah. got. The last thing I want to see in my life is managers coming out to MF the umpire and covering their mouths. Yeah. <laughs> so you can't see them like, actually, you're doing quite well. I think that yeah. pitch was a couple inches outside. Could you please throw me out? Uh, I don't want anyone <laughs> to see, but I think you're a swell fella. Like. Give me a break. Give me an absolute break. Um, all right. Before we get to the week ahead, you uh, you texted me a trivia question. You did not text me the answers. I swear to you, I did not look up the answers. So mm-hmm. let's let's play a game. This is the equivalent of when uh, Higgins on our roundtable has the seventh inning stretch. What, what do you yes. got for me? So um, I was curious after the Padres uh, played and were swept by the New York Mets, and it seemed like they were single-handedly swept by J.D. Martinez, uh, who had an unbelievable series against the Padres, as he seemingly always does. Jesse talked about it a little bit on the radio, that he's like a, he mentioned that he's a Padre killer. He used those words. And so that made me curious about who are the other uh, let's call them certified Padre killers. And what I mean by that is 
they have at least somewhat of a sample size to say that they've been good because, you know, of course, someone comes in, they have a really hot series, like whatever. Um, but so I looked on the list uh, on Stathead and you can look this up yourself if you're curious of uh, people with at least 100 plate appearances in their career against the Padres and sorted by OPS and wanted to see just basically who are the certified Padre killers. And I was uh, surprised uh, to find that J.D. Martinez is seventh all time hmm. since the existence of the Padres in OPS for all players with at least 100 plate appearances against the Padres. He has an OPS of 1094 <laughs> against the Padres. He's slashing 333, 428, 667 in 131 plate appearances against the Padres. So that's seventh all time at 1094. I'm curious for you, Craig, do you happen to know who the other six are? Okay, so what I did is I jotted down on a on a little note mm -hmm. uh, players who came to mind. And I, I'm telling you, I didn't look this up. So who knows how well I will do. There's certainly lifetime bias there could have been somebody in the six seventies that owned the padres that i wouldn't know about um i feel like the number one name on that list has to be barry bond he is in fact the number two name on the list okay uh but that is uh that is correct barry bonds is number two all time with an 1153 ops career against the padres it's completely insane to me that someone is higher than that. And I'm going to say, not only is someone higher, someone is much higher in a way that feels comical and not real. Um, so he's number two. So Bond's second. Okay. Eleven fifty. Now, this just occurred to me as you said that. But like, just lately, the number one Padre killer has to be Schwarber. Schwarber has just, it's a homer every time against the Padres, but I don't know if he's done enough from the plate appearance standpoint. He has from the plate appearance standpoint. He's 155. However, he is actually 20th all time on the list. Wow. Okay. With a 1019 okay. OPS. All I'll of tell these you, people have been unbelievable. Like a 1019 yeah. OPS is 20th. I did not write his name down. I'm going to give you okay. the names I wrote down. That just occurred to me as you said it. Because yeah. I'm like, there's someone higher? Like, could it be Schwarber? He's homered every bad for the last year or two. Um, Historically, I remember when I came to town, Ted Leitner talking about this, that Dale Murphy was one of the ultimate Padre killers, the old Braves back-to-back -back MVP. Uh, he is actually not on my list, um, and he is, in fact, 77th as wow. at a 912 OPS. Yeah. <laughs> How crazy that, that there's 80 guys with an over 900 OPS against the yeah, Padres. Exactly. It's disgusting. It was All tough right. around here. All right. Andre Ethier always killed the Padres as a Dodger. Uh, he is not one of the six. In fact, Andre Ethier is 171st on the list at an 851 OPS. Still 851. Yeah. <laughs> it's 150 guys. What about Blackman? Uh, Blackman, you're, uh, I'm just going to say, uh, Chuck Blackman's, Nasty, uh, is 113th on the list with an 84. <laughs> I'm way off. Matt Kemp. Uh, Kemp is not here. He is 156 with an 859. You're, you're Kent? making this too personal. Kent? Jeff Kent? Jeff Kent. Is that what you're, is that yeah. your guess? Jeff Kent, Jeff Kent, 184 on the list, 845. Wow. These are all good guys who are very good, but we're talking like the certified the Padre I'm, killers. I'm flailing. These are, yeah, these are the people I remember is killing the Padres. Todd Helton was the last one I wrote down, and Terry Pendleton. Those are the last two I wrote down. Okay, I, th I think you overthought it a little bit. Todd Helton is 41st on the list with a 959. And who was the last one? Terry Pendleton. I don't know. That was super random. Okay, I did tell you uh, there was like one name on this. Uh, yeah. I can't even find Terry Pendleton. Terry Pendleton's not anywhere close to this. Okay, okay. so I'm going to go backwards order now. I'm going to try right. and give you some hints to try and suss this out. Okay. Uh, this is number six on the list, uh, and he had a ten, has a 1098 career OPS against the Padres. Um, started out in Miami, 
and uh, in the mid 2010s and uh, now plays in New York. Stanton. Stanton. Correct. Uh, John Carlos Stanton with 149 plate appearances against the Padres, 1098 OPS. Uh, here's a hint for you. With uh, This is fifth on the list with 128 plate appearances, a 1099 OPS. This player just played against the Padres in this series and had a pretty mid series. Current Milwaukee Brewer. Yelich? No. A current Brewer is a just current eating our lunch? Hoskins? Uh, unless I have the I have the wrong brother. I'm sorry, this is another hit. He's currently a Cardinal. He's currently a Cardinal. I have the oh, wrong brother. So that's Contreras then. Contreras. It is Will it is Wilson Contreras who has a career 1099 OPS against the Padres. I'm sorry, I had the wrong brother. I didn't mean to lead you astray. Fourth on the list. This is someone who played against the Padres in the year 1999 to 2003 before he then joined the Padres. Loretta? No. Mm. Don't overthink it. Power hitter. Power hitter joined, joined the, the Padres. Padres in 2004. Oh. Wait. Giles? Be correct. Brian Giles, number four on the list of certified Padres killers, 1126 OPS. That's disgusting. Uh, a c- career. Okay, this was the name on the list where I was like, if, if Craig gets this, I truly give up. Well, um, you don't have to is, give up. I got them all wrong. <laughs> this, is, this person was third on... This will be a good immaculate grid test. This person was third on the list. He had a career OPS in 105 plate appearances against the Padres of 11.48. He played against the Padres in the years 1982 to 1986. In his career, he played for, starting in 1979, the Baltimore Orioles. In 1982, he went to the Cincinnati Reds. He was in Detroit in 1983, went back to the Reds in 84 and 85, and finished his career as a Montreal Expo in 1986 with a career war of 3.6. Lord almighty, like Tracy Jones? I don't know. I'm not going to make you do this. His name was Wayne Krenchiki. <laughs> Wayne, Wayne Krenchiki? <laughs> Wayne fucking who? Wayne Krenchiki. Wayne Krenchiki? I don't know. I, I dead ass have never heard of this man before. And okay? I, th- I thought I knew every player that played in the 80s. I've never heard of this guy either. Certified Padre killer. 1148 OPS. Uh... <laughs> Barry Bonds is two, like we established. And this is number one, Craig, with an OPS of 1461 against the Padres in 136 plate appearances. I surely know this. You surely know this. You absolutely know this. Uh, Here's a hint for you. At one point, he was in the Padres organization, but never as a player. He was a like really good ex- hitter. That's a hint. So an ex-player who joined our organization? Oh, I don't In know. In his Just post-playing career. Mark McGuire. Mark oh. McGuire. Mark McGuire has a 1461 career OPS against the Padres and 136 plate appearances. His slash line was 389, 507, 954. He hit 18 home runs against the Padres in 108 at bats. Wow. I see, if you had told me those numbers, I would have been, yep, that's Barry Bonds. You told me. Yeah. Yeah. Like Bonds uh only slashed the paltry 317, 473, 680 against the Padres. So at least sorry to say that. At least the first name I said was Bonds. Yeah. And every guy I brought up actually did kill the Padres. Yeah. Yeah. Just only to paltry 950 OPS. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Man, we've been owned. It's tough. It's tough. I texted, I, a friend of mine's a Yankees fan, and I texted him like the all time list. And uh, there's only 10 players who have above a thousand op- career OPS against the Yankees. And we have 24. <laughs> my god yeah yeah 
So there's your certified Padre killers. J.D. Martinez, Giancarlo Stanton, Wilson Contreras, Brian Giles, Wayne Franchicki, (laughs) Barry Bonds, and Mark McGuire, your all-time Padre killer. Wow. Wow. (laughs) Wow. Good list. Good list. Yeah, it's a great list. Yeah. I guess we've forgotten everything about Mark McGuire, including the times he destroyed the Padres. Mark McGuire, a forgotten player to history. Um, Unless you happen to be around in 1998. And you might remember. Let's wrap up with the week ahead. The Nationals are in town. I I regret to inform our Padres Hot Tub listening populace that the good times ended on Sunday. Because on Sunday, the Padres faced a right-handed starter for the fourth consecutive game. And of course, three of those four games, the Padres pulled out wins and put up delightful run totals along the way, scoring seven and nine and six runs. And now the Nationals are here. And while the Washington Nationals give you all kinds of interesting storylines, such as, of course, C.J. Abrams coming back and Mackenzie Gore pitching uh, for the team on Tuesday uh, and and a, a young team that somehow finds itself just a game uh, behind the San Diego Padres, the only thing I'm focused on, Rafi, is that they're going to throw three straight lefties against the Padres uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And Chris Ello has been keeping a close track on this at our station. 22 straight left-handed starters have allowed three or fewer runs to the San Diego Padres. 17 of the 22 allowed either one or zero runs to the San Diego Padres. 22 in a row. So, the ultimate test occurs on Monday night as the worst lefty in baseball, Patrick Corbin, dog shit for four straight years, leads the universe in hits allowed, runs allowed, homers allowed, Like year after year after year. This year, is he better? No, he's just as bad as he's always been. ERA in the high fives. If Patrick Corbin holds this fucking team to one run in six innings, they they might as well not show up Tuesday and Wednesday. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't really have like much else to say beyond that. I mean, just looking at uh uh the splits right now. It's kind of hard to believe that the Padres, I think they're ranked like 18th right now against lefties. It's kind of hard to believe that that could possibly be the case um, because they felt so bad. But but that being said, if you restrict that to the first six innings of the game, when you're most likely going to face a lefty, uh, they fall to 22nd, 22nd in terms of total offense, uh, just a 90 WRC plus. Uh, which is uh, how you say not good. So um, I don't really have much else to say about this team other than the way that they face lefties compared to righties, especially when this team is built to mash lefties, feels unsustainable. Um, so I feel like we're, gonna, we're due for some regression, but that's also total gambler's fallacy. That's not like, it's not oh, they've been bad, so now they're going to be good. Um, It's just at some point we have to see uh, what this team is made of because if not, like, I don't know how they can ever expect to succeed in the playoffs if they're so lucky to get there. If they continue this trend of left being against lefties like this all year because in a short series, in in a best of five series, which is what the Padres would have, best of three potentially, um, you just line up lefties against them. Slam dunk. So, um, I don't know. Are you hopeful? Are you hopeful things will change against lefties? No. <laughs> no. I mean, like, it, it needs to eventually, but they've put in a whole solid half season of work to be terrible against lefties. Yeah. So, I, I cannot say now that this is an anomaly or this is just wacko, weirdo, baseball is stupid stuff. Like, it's the combination of. Every single right-hander in this lineup, save like one, 
is slashing way worse against lefties. Any reason why? There's no reason why. It's probably the randomness of baseball, but that's happening. And then there are three critical lefties upon whom this team's offensive success is predicated in Arise, Cronenworth, and Merrill. And, you know, Merrill's recent home run surge aside, all three of those guys decline against left handed pitching. Now they go from great to, you know, in some cases bad or in some cases okay, but it's still less than it is on the other side. So once you get to that, when you get to the right side, you've got these left handed hitters that are killing it, and you've got these right handed hitters that are killing it. You go to against a lefty, you, all your lefties get a little worse, and all your righties get a lot worse. And that part doesn't make any sense. But it is the reality of the situation, which leads to a question. It's been the number one cause celeb in our Discord the last 48, 72 hours. Get Eggy Rosario back to the big leagues. Because Eggy Rosario, for the month that he was up, uh, killed lefties. And he hit three homers against lefties. And that's still, I think, the second or third highest total of the year for the Padres against lefties is Eggy Rosario's three home runs. Um, I have. Two major barriers to this, Chris, or Rafi, and you're Rafi, not Chris. (laughs) I have two major barriers to this. The first is if Eggy Rosario comes up, Tyler Wade has to go. And Mm -hmm. I do not believe Eggy Rosario can fill all the holes Tyler Wade can fill. Uh, I think Tyler Wade is more valuable to this team day to day for his ability to play the outfield like he's had to, to be the emergency catcher, to fill in at any infield position, um, and and to be useful. And also, by the way, that he is a designed bench player. He's at the age of his career. He's never going to be a starter. He knows it. He comes to mm-hmm. the ballpark every day working to get ready for that one at bat or that one appearance or or that maybe lucky start. Eggy Rosario still believes he's going to be an everyday big leaguer you know, in major league baseball, he's not mentally built or skill set built to be the once every six days guy off the bench. And yet he probably is one of the six best hitters in the franchise against left-handed pitching. So it's, it's a very difficult situation that I don't see an easy way to bring him up. Yeah. Um, just to put a number on it for folks, um, in a admittedly limited sample size in El Paso this year against lefties, uh, Eggy Rosario has an OPS of 1382. So remember Mark McGuire against the Padres? Basically, yeah. that's what Eggy Rosario is for lefties. Uh, and I mean, El Paso is basically like juicing, right? Um, but uh, anyway, um, I look, the, the issue with the organization right now is that the clear redundancy, uh, weak link, whatever you want to say, is Jose Azokar. But the issue is that they need someone to play center field when Jackson Merrill is not playing center field. And right now, Jose Zocar is the only person who can do that. Um, so as long as they don't have a viable backup center fielder, Jose Zocar is going to be on the team. Um, and so that creates the infield log jam, unfortunately, that they're in. And yeah, I do think Eggy Rosario is uh, deserving of a spot, certainly if they're going to be doing weird platoon stuff against lefties. But you would also think that, you know, that would mean that Donovan Solano is going to have to be a DH question mark. Uh, and that would, so that would only work on days when Manny Machado is playing the field. Uh, and, you know, you're not going to move Solano off because Solano has been great. Um, so I just don't see what the solution is right now. And you're right. Like it, Tyler Wade is that person that we've talked about of like, you want him on the wall. You need him on the wall. You need Tyler Wade to be there uh, to play shortstop occasionally or to pinch run late in games, you know, if you're not going to pinch run Jose Zocar. So, um, yeah, it's unfortunate. That's an, also, I'm not going to just like try and uh, engineer some reason why Eggy Rosario isn't deserving to be a big leaguer. I think he is. He still, he does strike out a ton still. And, you know, against lefties, he's uh, struck out in a third of his plate appearances or a third of his at-bats, excuse me. Um, so, you know, it's hard for me to, to say that, oh, he's the salve. Uh, but as things stand right now with the team being somewhat healthy in the infield, uh, all things considered, you know, Xander aside, um, I don't really see a place for him. Yeah. 
No, me neither. And I wish they, I wish I did. I really do. I wish I did, but I'm not going to cut Solano and I'm not going to cut Wade. And those are the only two guys you could cut. So tough scene for Eggie. Yeah. Maybe he's the guy we trade for a reliever at the end of the, at, at the deadline. And it's not going to be great for us if he ever does what Chris said last show and goes and hits 20 homers in the big leagues. I don't personally see that for Eggie Rosario, um, but doesn't mean it couldn't happen. Um, lastly, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm very grateful that the team is where they are. I, I'm going to be completely frank. I thought that the Padres were going to go one and six this past week. I, I really did. I, I thought they would probably get swept in Philadelphia, finish the road trip 0-6, come home, and win a game against the Brewers because so many things are set against the Padres right now. You know, unlike last year where we're like, we have this and that and the other thing, and the fourth thing, and we're still six, seven games under. Right now, I'm looking at the team and going, I could see a world where this team lost every game for three weeks. They they have an injured Tatis, an injured Machado, an injured Profar, an injured Arise, an injured Camposano, no Musgrove, no Darvish, Cease pitching like shit, Vasquez pitching like shit. Uh, you know, before they were available, Major was out there turning in losses every single time all the pressures on Matt Waldron to carry the team. You know, like Michael King showed you again today, he can't carry the team. He's a good, interesting pitcher. He can't carry the team because every other start, he's only going to go four plus innings and throw a hundred something pitches. So with all of these things happening and the team playing 13 in a row day off, 13 in a row day off, 13 in a row, like this could have been where this entire year fell apart. This last week, I was frankly expecting the team to get to four or five games under 500 and be at the bottom of that pairing, you know, that pack of nine people. And then we were going to look up and go, ah, it's not that far to get back up. It's okay. We'll get there when we're right. Right now, it's Sleepy Bob's Giants that are at the bottom of that pack. And they're in that same thing. They're five, six games under. Doesn't mean they're out of it. No one down there is out of it. But this could have been our team. And they pulled out. They pulled out some wins this week, man. They pulled out some wins that were improbable and ones that get put in the bank and you cannot take away. Yeah. And that, that'll kind of brings me to my last note of the, of the show. Um, you know, my, one of my favorite scenes in anything ever is the scene at the end of Moneyball, which I've referenced twice on this show or on this episode, uh, where Jonah Hill and, and Billy, uh, Billy Bean, Jonah Hill and Billy Bean, Jonah Hill and Brad Pitt, are breaking down tape and you know they're watching this minor leaguer who stumbles on the base paths and you know he, he thought he's made a mockery of himself but he looks up and realizes he's hit a home run and brad pitt looks at jonah hill and says how can you not be romantic about baseball which is just one of my favorite 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 things in anything and uh i am down here in san diego right now unfortunately because uh my grandfather passed away last week and uh when i found i got to he'd been ailing for a long time and uh you know he was out of his suffering and in a better place and uh but when my dad i had gotten to say goodbye to him on father's day lucid conversation talked about rory blowing the us open lead it was it was good you know <laughs> it was as good of a conversation as you could hope for and when my dad called me to tell me the news that he had finally passed he was at the padres game on thursday night with his brother uh, he and his brother were there together watching the game. They got the news that their dad had died and, you know, nothing to do at that point. They just stayed and watched the game and, uh, they got to see a very, very exciting game. Lead changes looked like they had squandered everything. And then they saw with two outs in the bottom of the ninth inning, Jake Cronenworth hit a missile and walk it off. And I say that because how can you not be romantic about baseball? You know, um, my grandfather was born and raised in San Diego and, uh, you know, we, uh, we keep on trucking, but it's important to have those moments and to hang on to them and remember that this sport can be beautiful sometimes as stupid and as dumb and as frustrating as it is it can be beautiful, which is why we do it. So, uh, that's my final note. 